Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the By Word Show. So glad you're here today. This is going to be a fun one. I have Lana Sullivan here with us, and we're just going to dive in and see what comes up. We got a lot of stuff to cover today, so buckle up. It's going to be a good one. Before we get started, Lana, would you just introduce yourself to those who don't know you yet? Yeah, so my name is Lana Sullivan, and I founded Girl Teach Me. I think it's been about four years. It's hard to believe. And most of my time really is spent just homeschooling my four kids. I've got two boys, two girls, eight and under. So really, I'm only homeschooling two, but I'm home most of the time. And so this whole thing is happening in the fringes of my day. If I get up early, nap time, you know, those kind of things. So yeah, I'm just, I love being with my kids. Like I love it. And yet it's still so fulfilling to have a purpose that goes beyond motherhood. I love motherhood so much, but it's so fun to be just thinking how I can empower women, like the struggles that I have as Mm -hmm. a woman, how can I reach back maybe and help the women that are a little bit younger than me or even in the the same life phase. So that's what Girl Teach Me is all about. It's just empowering women. I love that so much. And I really feel like there's a need, especially like you said, with moms, it's, it's hard when you get in certain stages of life, even outside of motherhood, it could be a job. It could be just a season of life that you're in and you can feel so limited to that thing. So I love that you are not only doing the thing of pursuing your purpose alongside motherhood, but teaching other women how to do the same. So what has that journey been like for you? How did Girl Teach Me come about? And what is, what, like, what is your story that led up to this? Yeah, so it's fun to think back to the beginning of it. So I, my third child, her name's Nola. She's, she's four now. She was about six months old. And I felt almost like that feeling of expecting, like I felt like God was about to do something. I almost, Mm. but this sounds weird, but like almost like pregnant with this idea, like it was stirring in me and I'm like, what Lord, what are you doing? And so I'm just journaling. I knew I I used to coach college softball. So I've always been passionate Mm. about women and softball was just the avenue for that. But then when I came home from college softball, to be with my kids. I'm, I'm, my passion for loving and helping and discipling women didn't go away. And so mm. I felt like God was just doing a new thing. It was no longer going to be through the avenue of softball, but through some other different kind of avenue. And for a while, I thought, well, let me back up. It really started when I took a plane ride to California to go visit a friend. And on the plane ride, I just, you know, packed women of the word. I was going to start it and I could not put it down. Like Jen Mm. Wilkins book, women of the word, I tore it up. I mean, I just wrote all in it and I felt God birthing this passion in my soul that, you know, really similar to Jen Wilkin, her mission is to help women understand the word. And I felt like my, my mission was similar, except maybe more to put flesh on it to, for Mm. women to see like the example of what it could be like to live a faithful life. Not that we're all going to do that exactly the same, but just for women to see what it could be like in this day and time to follow the Lord and to learn to read your Bible and things like that. And so it just has morphed over time. I thought it was going to be Instagram, but then I realized I'm not on my phone every day. I can't, I can't even find my phone sometimes, honestly. And (laughs) Honestly, and I kind of like that feeling. And so YouTube's been a better fit. I can sit down at nap time, Mm. film my video, be intentional for that amount of time, and then click back into mom mode with my phone, who knows where. So (laughs) yeah, yeah. So that's really kind of how it's gotten started. But it's been lots of shifts and pivots through the time. But women have always Mm. been central to the heart of what I'm trying to do. That's really amazing. I love that because I think you're right. I think there's a lot of women who want to do it well. You know, they want to know how to read the Bible. They want to know how to pray. And like, what does it practically look like to live out this faithful life? And I love that you're just modeling that right in the middle of all these other things that you're doing. Like it's just a natural organic part of your life. And it makes it seem so doable, you know, because I feel like as women, sometimes we get this big lofty idea of, okay, I got to sit down and study my Bible for an hour a day. And I got to go to every prayer meeting, every service. I got to be involved in every ministry and small group and all the things. And, and it's just become such a simple thing. I feel like for you to just work it into whatever season you're in. 
So what has that process been like for you as you were developing these practices, either like before or after becoming a mom, even like what has that looked like for you? Well, it's been lots of failure. And I think it's important for me to share to share failures too and to share things that aren't working so well or maybe worked well for a season and don't work well anymore. And I think it's important for women to embrace the season that they're in and mm-hmm. to not to not work so hard against it, but work with it, work smartly with it. So it's like, you know, when we have moments where it's just going to be maybe five minutes, we're not going to be interrupted. Well, you know, instead of really hoping to sit down and dive super deep and then getting frustrated when you get, when you get interrupted a million times, it's like, okay, well, let's see how we can get those short snippets of the word in us Mm -hmm. any way we can. Like, just go like when you walk it's not like when you walk into church and you have that warm up worship song it's like no it's like now like i have this moment now i'm going to read this passage over and over and over again or listen to it mm. just getting really creative and having fun with it like this is a relationship so it should be fun yes. it should be innovative and creative and it shouldn't be rigid and it shouldn't be just this that icky religious feeling it should be vibrant and fun and then you know, if you still have that craving to go deep in the word, which I think is wonderful, you know, maybe it's using your discretionary time of like coffee shop time or gym child's care and using and redeeming that time to go deeply in the word once or twice a mm-hmm. week. Let's not underestimate how valuable that can be. If we go on a date with our oh, husband yeah. once or twice or three times a month, that sometimes can keep the fires going. And the right. same goes with our relationship with the Lord. And so I think we just need to take the pressure off, embrace the season and just the Lord knows our heart. So just give it all to him with whatever time we've got. That's so good. I love that so much. And I think you're right. Like there's just a freedom when you look at it that way. It's not about rules. It's not about routines. It's not about just checking the box. You know, it is a relationship. And I think that's such a cool example of going on dates with your husband. You know, it doesn't take every single day sitting down for an hour and debriefing your whole life and making sure there's this like super passionate connection, you know, like that would be a lot to maintain. And I think it's so right. Like God just wants to be with us, whether that's five minutes in a random point in the day or that intentional time. And so that is, that's just a really cool way to look at it. I'm curious since you started your journey and especially because you've been sharing on YouTube for quite a while now, have you started to have conversations with women who are asking certain questions or struggling with certain things? Like what themes do you see come up that are challenges for a lot of women? I think a lot of women who are being really honest about their faith are like, I don't want to read my Bible. I don't desire to, Mm. I don't feel like it. And, you know, while I'm, I'm over here on one hand saying, okay, you know, you have to embrace the season. There's this other hand that is like, okay, we have to come at anything that we want to see excellence in with an area of discipline. And Mm -hmm. we have to come at it with, I don't feel like it, but I don't, that's, I'm trying to teach my kids. Okay. You don't feel like doing your chores, but what's the right thing to do? Let's do the Mm -hmm. next right thing. Even if we don't feel like it, if our filter for what we do is what we feel, that's a very dangerous place to be. And so I come to the word, you know, as much as I can daily, if I can, because it's the right thing to do. And I know it's going to help me see the world with the right lenses and see truth and, and be aware of lies and, and ultimately be able to pour out to other people I love. So like one thing I like Mm -hmm. to say is, you know, we're leading ourselves so we can lead our children and we can lead others. If we're not first leading ourselves primarily in the word and in truth, how can we rightly see to lead others? And so, so much is at stake. So while it's, you know, it's a vibrant, fun relationship. You also have to come at it with an area of discipline. And I think the same Mm. goes for marriage. I think it's almost like that's like our, with our, with what we can see in this world, that's how we can liken it to it's that relationship. Like I can love Matt and it can be fun and exciting. And with some discipline, I'm going to have to make time for him. And I'm going to have to sit down and ask what his day's like when I really want to talk or, you know, yeah, it's so nuanced, but discipline has to be a part of it too. Yeah, that's such a good point because I think I, I mean, I have been someone who has struggled kind of on the opposite side where a lot of women I feel like have the, the, the side of the struggle where it's like, oh, I just love the relationship 
part of it and the sweet little, oh, read my sweet devotional and have my worship time, which isn't bad, right? Like that's beautiful and that's sweet and that's such a vital part of our relationship with God and our faith. But then there is a discipline side and I feel like that's the side that I lean to the most where it's like, okay, I read my Bible every day. But at that point, it's just a habit. It's just a routine that I'm that I'm taking a box every day and I miss the relationship side of it. So I think it is such a dance, like finding that balance between it's not just about like the fluffy sweet stuff of putting on a worship song every day. And it's not just opening your Bible to say that you did that day. Like there's a sweet spot in the middle that's sometimes hard to find. But I love what you said about just knowing the season you're in. Because I'm sure that kind of helps you find the balance too, right? Right. Like right now, I'm I'm waking up early almost every day and I'm reading the word and I'm reading it for a length of time. I'm not breastfeeding right now. I'm not pregnant. Mm. And I have more energy than I've probably had in the last nine years. And so, <laughs> you know, I'm appreciating this season, but I also have so much empathy for the woman who is literally so exhausted. Maybe she's, you know, postpartum and she's depleted you know, God just wants whatever we have to offer it to him. I think he thinks mm. that's very, very beautiful in his sights. Like the widows might, like whatever energy and time you have, offer it to the Lord. He's going to, he's going to triple, quadruple that with what you get in return from him. So, mm. um, yeah, I think we're so hard on ourselves, but then sometimes I think we make lots of excuses too. It's like this, you know, back and forth. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, totally. Well, and kind of right alongside that, something you talk about that I think is so, so important is this idea of victim and villain mentality. Can you just talk to us about that for a minute? What is going on? Why is this so hard for us as women? Yeah. So I read this book called Hero on a Mission and I just couldn't put it down. And in Truthfully, you know, the author, I like him. I don't agree with every bit of his theology, but one thing I think he really nails on the head is that there's four characters in almost every story, the victim, the villain, the hero, and the guide. And the reason why they exist in stories is they first exist in us, but in stories, they're more mm -hmm. separate. You know, it's like this person for the most part remains the villain, the whole, you know, the whole story or the whole movie. And once you see it in movies, you really can't unsee it. But the thing that connects us to story is we identify with parts of the victim, parts of the villain, parts mm -hmm. of the hero and parts of the guide. And the victim is the person who really can't help themselves. They are absolutely helpless. And let's be clear, there's absolutely victims in the world. There's real victims right. in the world and we need to be doing whatever we can to help them. But it's very, it's very, what's very important to remember is let's say, let's take the human trafficking example. They are victims of human trafficking. The moment mm -hmm. they are rescued from human trafficking, they no longer refer to them as victims. You know, it's survivors of, of human trafficking. It's very important to move them from the victim role into the hero role as quickly as possible because now they have some right. significant pain they have, to, they have to overcome. And that pain is central. The, the, the victim has the pain, the villain has the pain, the hero has the pain, and the guide has the pain. Everybody's done different things with the pain. And that's the heart of it is that we're in a fallen world and everybody's going to have pain. The unique pain of motherhood. Motherhood is hard. It's beautiful, but it's hard. There's a pain there. There's a dying of self that is both good for us and hard. But what are we going to do with it? Are we going to, you know, there's the the mean mom, scary mom kind of blogs where it's villainizing our kids. Like they are our main problem and they're the reason why I've lost myself. But really, that's not true. You know, really, Christ says something completely different. Like, come and die, like, you know, then you, then you gain. And mm -hmm. so what I've tried to help people understand is if you feel helpless, if you feel hopeless, then you're really not living into the story God has for you. He doesn't want to keep, he doesn't want you to stay a victim. He wants you to step up into the pain. And that's not because we can become the hero of our life because we're awesome. It's that Jesus is our guide. And he's saying, Lana, I know that being at home with four kids can be lonely and it can be hard. And I know you don't feel like getting out of bed today, but we're going to do it by my power and by my strength. And so I'm really passionate about helping women understand, okay, do you feel like you have no story? Like you're a bit part of your own story. Well, how can we move you into the hero slot 
where you're being Mm -hmm. intentional and you're exercising that free will God's given you, you know, it's like free will and sovereignty both together. They seem, how could they possibly exist together? But he gives us free will to step up into our story and transform our pain so that we can then go help other women do the same. We can be the guide. That's the ultimate place to be. Wow. It's just super insightful because you're right. I I have never thought about it that way, how we identify with those roles, like the story, like they're first in us. I've never heard it put that way, but it makes so much sense because I think you're right. There are seasons where we're all the pieces, like we can rotate throughout life, but could you talk to us kind of about the danger of operating most of the time from those other places? So, you know, if you're, if you're operating from the victim mentality, then you're literally waiting for somebody to save you at all times. So that, that could be husband coming home. Like I'm literally just trying to get through the day until my husband can come home. I've totally been there. I could be there tomorrow. It's so, you know, it's so easy to get there. Or we feel like, you know, it's just basically that we need to be saved, that we cannot step up into anything hard on our own. That's the victim. And then the villain if we're operating out of that, well, then our husband's our worst problem. Our kids are our worst problem. Other people are our worst problem. Our friend who doesn't include us, she's our she's my worst problem. Everybody else is is out to get me. Everybody else is, th- I'm taking my pain of whatever I'm feeling and I'm saying, I don't want anybody else to feel this way. So I'm going to get back at the world. I'm going to get mm. back. There's like this revenge that's where the villain perspective comes, I think, primarily in womanhood. And you see this, this is not going to be a popular statement, but you see this a lot with feminism because it's villainizing men to say, you know, you are my worst problem. You have been holding me back from everything I want in the world and I will rise up as woman and I will push you down. And that, right. that that's not, that's not going to be life-giving, number one, for the women or the men. And, and then we have the hero. Now, the hero doesn't feel like the hero most of the movie. If you look at any movie, they feel very uncomfortable. They don't feel like the hero. That's why they have to have the guide. The guide is literally like, come on, you can do this. Like, you know, it's Mary Poppins. It's Yoda. It's, I mean, oh man, there's so many good guides. I think of Princess Diaries. If you ever watch that, the queen, <laughs> the queen is the guide. Like we want to be the queen. We want to be the guide. Well, we want to be the queen. That'd be fine. But <laughs> yeah, I love the queen. But we want, we want, we want to be the guide. You cannot be the guide unless you have first been the hero. You cannot help other people unless you have first leaned into every bit of what's hard in your own life. Mm-hmm. And I really think, by the power of Jesus, walk through it. And then the beautiful part is, He redeems our pain, and we get to help other people with whatever we've gone through. Wow. Oh, that's so good. So how do we get to that point? Like, how do we go through the transition or the progression to get to that hero spot most of the time? You know, like, like you said, it could be back to the villain tomorrow. It could be back to the victim tomorrow. But for the most part, how do we get through the stuff, the pain, all the things that keep us in those other spaces so we can live as the hero and then progress to the guide? Yeah, I think it's a great question. Um, I think, first of all, it's just awareness. It's just awareness that, okay, I am in victim mode right now. We literally use that language in our house. Like I use mm-hmm. it with my kids. They use it with me. I, you, my husband, you know, sometimes we get in fights about it, but I'm like, <laughs> you know, he's like, Lana, I literally hear the victim. And I'm like, oh, I don't want you to tell me that right now. <laughs> Uh, you know, and I've said, so you know, we got in a squabble this morning and I'm certainly, I certainly was the villain. I mean, I was saying things aiming to hurt that, you know, but what kicks us out of that quicker than anything, one awareness two gratitude, you cannot mm. feel helpless. If you are thankful, you cannot wow. feel like the villain and get revenge if you are thankful. And so I know it feels trite sometimes where people are like, I make my gratitude list and things like that, but it does, it helps you understand that God is coming to your help, that he, you are not helpless. He has been helping you all along and it allows you to not be the villain because while there is pain, people have been kind to you this week. And like you, you, you're, you're seeing with eyes that, okay, there is something productive coming from this pain. So nothing kicks me out of victim and villain mode like gratitude. Oh, that's so good. Had a conversation with a friend a while back where she was kind of discussing this idea with me and something she said that totally shifted my perspective about this whole like 
victim mentality versus hero mentality is the the thought as a victim that life is happening to you everybody's out to get you and then shifting to this is happening for me this is for my good god is working for my good even the pain like you said nothing is wasted there's there's purpose in it which i think is just a shift that can't happen, like you said, until there's a bit of awareness. And I love the gratitude piece. I really think that's become this buzzword or this cliche. But truly, that is one of the quickest ways and effective ways to get out of that like rut of just feeling like in a funk, you know? Absolutely. I mean, I think that's so true. And one thing Matt and I do every week is we sit down and we have this like weekly meeting. We call it like our couples weekly meeting. And one thing that we do on that that has been absolutely transform transformational is we list out the ways we saw God work that week. I mean, and my husband is very wow. type A. He, he's he got, it's a Google sheet. I mean, it's a Google sheet <laughs> that we literally sit down in front of. We have this little projector downstairs. We throw it on the projector and we, you know, Hannah, I can't tell you the list gets longer and longer and longer. And we forget week to week. We look back. I mean, mm. the cool thing about the Google sheet is you can flip to the last quarter <laughs> and look yes. and the ways God comes through, but I forget, I forget. It's almost like making little Ebenezer stones that you just remember. And then when yes. we look at that, really, God has been interweaving so many blessings, even things that are hard that we, you know, weeks later we can write on that list. Wow. That was really tough, but I, I did see him start to redeem it in this way or that way for this person. Mm. So that, that's been a really cool practice for us. And that just, you, it's hard to villain, villainize the other person in that weekly meeting about their target purchase, which would be me going rogue at target. <laughs> when you just made a huge gratitude list, like it really helps us understand we're not each other's enemy. We're each other's, we're on each other's team. We're pulling the same weight. So that's just like yes. one example of how we try to flex that gratitude to stay in hero mode as a couple. Yeah, I love that. I do think that would be transformational because just like you said, how often do we get frustrated and we think everybody else is the enemy, but they're just not. And I feel like that's the quickest way to cause division in a marriage or any relationship is to place blame and think you're fighting the person, but we're not like, that's not the real enemy. So we've got to get out of that mindset so we can actually work together and get some stuff done, you know, like we can't live Absolutely. purposefully if we're fighting each other all the time. Yeah. And I, and one thing Matt like this, Matt, I like to say is, you know, we see two, two horses pulling side by side, you know, it's like these two Clydesdale horses. And you think that if you put two together, they would pull double the weight, they pull it triple the weight. But then when you train those two horses to run together, they pull like quadruple five times the weight. And so in marriage, if you're married, God's put you with that person so that you can do more together for the kingdom than you ever could do alone. Mm. But it's not going to happen if you're villainizing each other. Totally. Yeah, that's such a good point. I love that. That's a perfect example. Oh, my goodness. So what are some things besides the check-in with your husband, which I think is brilliant? We've started doing that again this year, too, and it really is such an anchor point in the schedule to just – come back together. Are there other things that you do in your week or even day to day to help you stay in that hero or guide mindset? Yeah. Um, I can tell you one that's slightly creepy, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty funny. I read hero on a mission and he said to write your eulogy and he, mm -hmm. he said it really helps you fight against death denial and how death denial is one of the things that really keeps you from having traction in your story. And so one thing Matt and I did when we went away this year is we wrote our eulogy, which it wasn't as creepy as you would think because we weren't, it's not really what we want people to read at our funeral, <laughs> but it's what we would like to have accomplished by the end of our life, the people that we would like to be. And that really helps me fight against victim and villain mode too, because I remember that I am in a story. I'm in, I remember that in any story, there's going to be conflict and pain and, and I'm trying to go for something, you know, I'm, I'm shoot, I'm waking up every, every morning and I'm trying to put a plot on the map. I'm trying to move forward in my story. And I think that's what I would like a lot of women to understand is yes, God is sovereign and yet he gives you free will. And that means you should exercise your giftings, your mind, and you should try to figure out in tandem with the Lord, where he wants you to go and what he wants you to do. 
how, mm-hmm. what part do you have to play? You know, it's like the body of Christ. Like what, what is your gifting? What do you need to, what do you need to do? You know, I think some women literally feel depressed and lonely and hopeless in the victim role at home because they think that there's nothing big for them to do. And, and most of what is big for me to do is to create an atmosphere of learning for my kids to a safe place for them to feel loved and to feel like they're coming into their own story. That means, you know, doing laundry for them, putting clothes on their back, washing dishes, making meals, like those things that I think a lot of women despise or they look down upon. Those are parts of my story, but it's not just to cook the next meal or or wash the next load of clothes. It it has purpose because Mm -hmm. I am in a story that requires those things. And so if I think if I'm, if there's a woman listening who just feels really unfulfilled in motherhood, unfulfilled in her role as a woman, I would say, what's the story you want to live into? Think about that story. And when you think about it, it helps you wake up in the morning when you just feel like you just can't put another foot in front of the other. The hero is, is working hard on the behalf of other people. So what story can you live that's going to serve and help other people getting outside of ourselves? Mm. That also helps kick you out of victim villain mode. Victim and villains are not living for other people. They're living for themselves. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's such a good way to look at it because it is easy to get into those, you know, like yucky mindsets where you just feel like, this is not the life that I hoped for. This is not what I want to be doing right now. This is not fulfilling, whether it's motherhood or your job or just the season you're in. And it's so easy to just feel like none of this is worth it. But I think like you, like you described, just realizing you're part of a bigger story, it just brings some purpose into the moment, gives you some perspective and reminds you why the little parts in the process matter because none of it is wasted. And I think that's so easy to forget when you're in the in-between spaces. And not a lot of people talk about that. Like, here's where I am now. This is where I want to be. I feel like that's a lot of the emphasis is here's how you get where you want to be. And here's how you become the superwoman of your life and all the things. But what about the in between and the messy middle where you're raising little kids who need a lot from you or you're in a hard season in your marriage or financially your job just isn't where you want it to be yet like it's hard to be in those seasons but to have the perspective that helps you remember there's purpose right now I'm living into a story and also too with your kids I think that's so beautiful because that even helps you realize you are in the guide mode, even setting an example for your kids. That's amazing. Like showing up and having kids who know that their mom is there and loves them and, and sees them and is showing them how to live a purposeful life. Oh, I just love that. And I think that's so easy to forget. We just miss that when we get so focused on what's not kind of going back to the gratitude piece, when we get so focused on what's not going right or where we're not, how we're not where we want to be yet and all of those things. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's a good way to put it. So I, I have a question about moving into the guide mode because I talk to a lot of women who feel like they have nothing to offer. Like maybe they've gotten through the process of healing from their pain or, you know, they're in a good spot, but they're like, I, I have this idea. I have this passion to help women, but I don't know how, I don't know how to share my story. I feel like I don't have anything that would help people. How do you help women work through all of that? Well, I think I think once you move into guide mode, you never leave hero mode either because while you have overcome some kind of hard pain in your life, there's a new pain that's cropped up. And so it's 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 being in both modes at the same time. It's like, okay, I'm going to reach back and help, you know, like I'm going to help women who are pregnant not be terrified of labor because what I was once terrified of labor, but I'm not pregnant right now. I'm going through a new struggle. You know, I have an eight-year-old boy who I'm trying to teach him how to read and do all the things. And so there's a fear, will he ever really learn how to read well and all these things? (laughs) And so I have older women who reach back and they help me and they're like, I had a child who didn't read till they were nine and now they're a lawyer. Lana, they read for a living, you know? And so I think it's realizing that at all times, God wants you to be both the guide and the hero. He wants you to step up into what's hard you know, right now in your life, take the next faithful step, do the next right thing by the power of the spirit inside of you. And yet he wants you to be the guide because surely there are things that other women need your help with. I think what's 
not healthy is for us to be all hero mode. You know, it's, it's all about me and my pain and all that I'm overcoming and forget other people. Mm. The, the, the guide role is actually the most fulfilling role. And, but if we're only in guide mode, we forget that we still are in process and we could somehow become puffed up or prideful that, you know, let me help you. I'm God's gift to the world. It's like, no, I mean, <laughs> I struggle with motherhood anger. I'm very open with that. It's like I flip a switch and my cortisol shoots through the roof. I try to share. I'm still in a lot of process with that. Now, I feel like I can help you a little bit. I'm still in process. One day, maybe I'll be more guide than hero in that area. But right now, I'm still having to be the hero of my motherhood anger. So (laughs) a woman has so much to offer because there's things she has surely overcome. Surely, if she could think back. What are some things you feel like God has brought you? What are some deep waters he's brought you through? What are some things you thought you would never see go away? I used to struggle with overeating and gluttony. Just used to struggle with stuffing down all of my emotions with food. I don't really struggle with that anymore by God's grace and mercy, but I can sure have empathy for a woman who is stuck in that cycle. You know, there's Mm -hmm. so many things like that. So yes, if you want to help women, you know, I'm just using it. Let's use a a business example. Let's say you want to help women launch their their course or whatever. Well, first you have to make your own course. I mean, like, (laughs) you know, first you have to do the thing. And I think our woman hearts sometimes want to be the guide without doing the thing. (laughs) That's not authentic. We can't do that. You know? Yeah, that's so true. But I think you bring up such a good point. It's not even about being perfect and being done with struggling forever. Like we don't have to wait until we're done with our process, which is never going to happen. Like like you said, we're always in the process, but just being willing to share from where you're at and what you know. And like you said, it doesn't even have to be anything crazy and amazing, this breakthrough that the world has never seen. It's just, man, there's this girl a few steps behind who doesn't really know how to read her Bible, but you've mastered a good study routine. So that's something you can share that could really give some breakthrough to somebody who's a few steps behind. And that is so freeing because I feel like it's so, it's just so easy to give into those lies that are like, oh, you don't have anything to offer. Oh, you're still in the process. You're not qualified. Who's going to listen to you? Who's going to take you seriously? And that just holds us back so much. And it doesn't help anybody. Like there's people who need what we have to offer, even if we're still in the process. And that's, and that voice that you're, you're describing so perfectly, that's the villain. That's the villain. We villainize ourselves all the time. The the wow. voice that, the voice that looks in the mirror and is like, Lana, everybody else is getting Botox. You should too. Villain. The, the voice that's like, you're so, you know, that outburst right there going to absolutely ruin your kids for life. Villain. The voice that's like, you have nothing to offer any other women because you're still struggling. Villain. And so it's like, once we start to hear that voice, that is not how Christ talks to us. That is not how a good friend talks to us. So we shouldn't be talking to ourselves like that either. So Mm. it's, it's, it's changing that voice too. And I think awareness is part of that. Wow. That's really good. So as somebody who's in the transition from villain or victim to hero, how do you find guides in your own journey? Oh man, like I could talk all day about this. This is why I named it Girl Teach Me because literally nothing has been, aside from the Bible, nothing has been more transformational in my life than older, wiser women, you know? And, Mm -hmm. and I've had mentors certainly that have been my age in certain areas. You know, I, I do YouTube. I have a friend mentor. She's like 24 years old and she's (laughs) teaches me everything about YouTube and I'm literally about to turn 35. So, you know, (laughs) it's like somebody who's a step ahead of you, regardless of their age and whatever life phase that you're currently struggling with trying to learn about. And it's, it's just humbling yourself and saying, Hey girl, can you teach me how you do this or that? Can you teach me how you get your kids to actually listen the first, second or third time? That would be great. (laughs) You know, like I'm watching the fruit of how you parent and I like I like your kids. They're fun to be around. Can you, can you tell me what you've done? Can you give me top tips? I mean, I meet with this woman once a week with a couple of other girls and she's living, she's giving me parenting advice. I taped it on the inside of my cabinets. I mean, I got to read that stuff often because I forget if I'm not looking them in the eye, they're not really listening. If I mm-hmm. yell through the house, I can't tell them not to yell. I mean, just <laughs> you, 
it's so basic, but so practical. But I think the problem is we're not getting in relationship. And so we feel like it's hard to ask for help. And so if you're, if you're listening and you feel like, I just can't even think of one person that I could reach out to. Well, the first thing you need to start doing is working on relationships, not gathering more data. You don't need to gather more data. You need to go and work on relationships because that's where real, oh, just the gratifying, like the, the wonderful parts of life is going to happen in relationships. So um, you need that probably more than anything else right now, you know? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And I feel like that's another piece of womanhood, especially in the social media world. For whatever reason, there seems to be this pressure to just be Miss Independent, figure it all out on your own. You don't need anybody. And that is just so, like you said, that's unfulfilling. It's not like, what's the point of of doing any of this if we don't have anybody else with us in the process, if we're not learning from anybody, and if we're not helping anybody, both sides are equally important. And so that is such a great point you brought up about it's not a matter of learning more from research, like finding more information, getting in relationships. I feel like even my own life, I looking back, I feel like some of the best transformational moments of growth happened in community, just being honest about where I was at and then asking for help, which is so simple. But for whatever reason, it seems like such a scary thing to do sometimes. It does. I think you're right. It really does. But I think if we can open up about what we're struggling with, about our pain, then we're going to find somebody else who's like, yes, I am walking through the same thing, or I just walked through the same thing a couple of years ago. Let me tell you what helped me. And so I think you're right. I think it might be, you know, a really great thing you're saying right there is that that vulnerability piece can probably also mm-hmm. help us move into the hero mode because we're not villainizing ourselves for our struggles. We're not feeling helpless. Like, Nobody can help me with this, but we're saying, okay, this is the hurdle I'm having to overcome right now. Uh, Anybody else want to weigh in in on this? Because I'm really struggling here. And I think that's the hero, really. Man, that's so good. Uh, I love this. I feel like we could sit here and just keep unwrapping this and unpacking this all day long. But before we go, I would love to know, is there anything you would specifically want to say to a woman who is just truly feeling like a victim in her life right now? Oh, man. I'd like to say... I really bet you have a lot of pain. I bet there are some things that have been really, really hard. And I don't want to gloss over that and say it's it's not true because, you know, everybody's pain is just this really unique mix. And, you know, maybe you have been wronged by somebody and you need to forgive and you need some help. Like, that's real. That's very, very real. But I want you to think about the woman who's possibly experiencing some similar pain. Like, She feels hopeless too. And so maybe the first step that you can take is starting to get help yourself is to reach out and share your pain with somebody else right now. And even though that might be hard and be, be kind of vulnerable because you might be the only person that can reach out and help that other woman, you know, but first you're going to have to not push your pain down, kind of deal with your pain, not villainize other people for your pain. Um, There's a story God wants you to live into and it includes walking through that pain and finding healing from that pain. And so, yeah, that's, that's what I would tell her is that both I'm, I'm very sorry that that has happened to you or you're going through that, but also there is purpose in the pain. There's, there's radical, wonderful purpose. And if I think about any great biography that I've ever read, there's some hard stuff that's happened to them, but they became the hero of it because they still helped other people through it. Man, that's so good and so beautiful. Thank you so much for being here and sharing not only your story, but what you know with us. I love that about what you do. So will you please tell everybody where they can connect with you, learn from you, all the things. If you really want to learn, um, YouTube's really my place. I, I try to come out with a new YouTube video every Saturday morning, just something you can click on while you're folding some laundry or doing some dishes and hopefully, you know, it'll spark a new idea for your week and you'll get excited about, you know, either motherhood or taking care of your home or something in a way that feels like you're really living into a story. So that's where people can really learn is YouTube. I think connect, man, I'm so, I'm so hit or miss on Instagram. I do check my messages (laughs) like once a week. Um, I'm, I'm definitely open to women emailing me too. I mean, it's not like I'm getting hundreds of emails. Like I, I totally have time to shoot back an email. It might take a, a week or so, but I don't want this to feel like 
I'm sitting on some pedestal far away. Like I, I do want to connect with women. I, I want to know there's other women who are behind the screen because there is. So, you know, women are always welcome to email me as well. And so, yeah, those are the main two places. I read every comment on YouTube. So if you watch one of the videos, I'll be down there too. Yay. Okay. Well, yes, you guys definitely need to go and subscribe. It's Girl Teach Me, right? Girl Teach Me. Girl Teach Me. Yes, it's so good. Her videos are amazing. You need to go and subscribe. Thank you so much, Lana, for being here. I'm so grateful for you and everything that you're doing to help women move up and on into that guide mode. (laughs) Oh, thank you, Hannah. I feel like that's what your podcast is really about too, though, if you think about it. I love it. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to tune into another episode of the By Words Show. I love having you here and I'm so thankful for your support. Don't forget to share a screenshot of this episode to let me know you were here. I can't wait to talk again soon, but in the meantime, be sure to come hang out with me on Instagram and remember, I am cheering you on.